We're joined now by Lila Tritikov, Corporate Vice President and Deputy Chief Technology Officer of Microsoft, and John Maeda, Chief Technology Officer at Everbridge. Lila is a leading expert on artificial intelligence and business transformation. In her role at Microsoft, she applies a cross-disciplinary approach to creating solutions that address some of the world's most challenging problems and empower humanity through technology. She is host of the soon-to-be-released The Art of Science podcast. John is an American technologist and product experience leader with a passion for resilience and renewal. Currently, John is serving as Chief Technology Officer of Everbridge, where he leads the company's long-term technology and product vision, including innovation and IP strategy. Please welcome to the stage, Lila Tritiko and John Maeda. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is exciting to be here. I get to interview Lila. And we were, or the, we're going to start off with the topic of art. Who loves art here? Anyone, any art lovers here? I see a few. Yeah, OK. So uh, just backstage, there were all those drums with all the signatures and stuff. And so we're like in a real art place here, but we're not doing jazz. Um, but I do know that we both come from formal art backgrounds and mix formal art, formal science engineering. Um, so could you share a little bit about the history of art and how it inter intersects with large language model AI and how that works? Yeah, what a funny question, isn't it? Um, you know, most of us scientists usually look at art as a very foreign discipline. And that's a, something that's only about 100 years old, maybe, maybe even less. I mean, art and science used to be one, one sort of discipline that worked together. And, uh, you know, if we even think about some of the uh, most interesting ideas that we ended up implementing in science, they come from science fiction. A lot of these things are sort of foreseen or fore-invented or uh, imagined, you know, so, uh, so to say, in, uh, in the works of art. And, and, and it's interesting to see, especially as, as we think about building these big models, when we go back, and you can believe or not believe whether, you know, we all have a language instinct. We definitely have a communication instinct. Um, I would say even, you know, we see it in animals. It's not just humans, right? We all want to communicate. And now our form of communication is symbols. And uh, whether that's those symbols form a language could actually form a visual language. So if we go all the way back to the caves of Lascaux or hmm. to um, hieroglyphs in Egypt, they're much more pictorial, right? So the language even itself started with images that we try to reproduce to record history, record data. So everything in the world, in a way, can be reduced to a type of language. And then it's, there's no surprise that models can then start to interpret it. Uh, and it can interpret all the way through you know, music and expression, artistic expression, of course. You know, the compressed version of it is words. So, uh, so I think it, you know, it's, it's very potent that uh, we see models emerging, the diffusion models um, like DALI, uh, that allow us now to create things, to actually create, generate things. And you know, a lot of people think that or feel that it's going to infringe on, um, you know, on, artistic, uh, on artists today. Uh, and you know, if you go back a uh, hundred, hundred and fifty years, I think people felt the same way about photography. Um, and uh, what happened in the end is that it pushed other art forms to actually innovate and reimagine themselves. It pushed photography to become its own art form. And you know, in 1900, I think, uh, there was this uh, little, it's, I call it the Browning moment, this little camera that uh, got created for, I think it was sold for a dollar, with an idea that children can take photographs. Right? So it's ultimate democratization of you know, expression back then. I think we're at the front end of a very similar uh, moment where we're, uh, we will allow people who normally cannot create but can see things in their mind's eye to actually become more and more artistic. Um, I think that's, uh, that's where we're headed. I hope that's where we're headed. You know, I would, has anyone studied art history here? Raise your hand. Maybe, maybe you did right over there. So um, 
uh, when Lila brought up, because we did a lot of rehearsals before this, so we've like <laughs> compressed like 100,000 gigabytes into a few gigabytes, but um, uh, visual language, when you brought that up, could you help people who don't understand that Oh, know what that means. Oh, yeah, so, so my, it's my, such a my powerful background. idea. And, well, you should talk about this because your latest book is actually how to talk to machine, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that, which I think is, is extremely relevant. But, you know, if you study visual arts, you know, I, my background, I, I studied artificial intelligence at Berkeley, and I did a parallel degree in, in visual arts. And uh, entry courses in art are called uh, the language, the visual language, right? Because it is, you know, it is the language that we communicate with. And we communicate differently. So if you think about it in terms of how our human brain works, it's, uh, it communic the, the way to communicate through visual, visual expression or through dance or through music, right? It touches a different part of your brain and sometimes much more immediate. And that's why for the longest time, you know, art was used to, you know, for religion, for example, because it evokes uh, emotion in the, not in the same way as language would. So as we think about AI and how AI starts to communicate, and AI is starting to communicate not just logical state, but emotional state, I think the, the artistic expression is going to become uh, not only more accessible, but even more important. Mm. Well, that's a, I mean, when you, when you said that, it made me think about how you know, Dali, Imogen, whatever, they all create these images, but it's because there, there's so much art history on visual languages that it was interpretable. Oh, exactly, exactly. So you can compress it and actually yeah. learn from it because yeah. we have thousands of years of, uh, of artistic expression. Yeah, that was so cool. Um, oh, so um, uh, next question is about, now we're gonna move to the application area, which is, uh, we move from art to application. Um, so Microsoft has quite a few large, large model capabilities, uh, sort of creeping their way into features and stuff with a partnership with OpenAI. Yeah. Um, can you share a bit about the practical applications of AI, whether consumer or enterprise? You know, the, I think one of the biggest challenges is that the domain is so vast. This thing can be used for so many so many different things, but constraining it is almost a problem. So I think somebody talked about this earlier today is, is figuring out what do people actually want out of it? What do, what do people want to, what problems is it going to solve? Um, is you sort of like a kid in a candy store, and what, what can you do? And of course, you know, the, one of the first applications has been with code, and you know, for those of you who are using GitHub Copilot, you're quite familiar, we're getting incredibly good feedback on that. It's just basically removing the grunt work out of, uh, out of writing code, and uh, it's becoming more and more sophisticated, so it's not just you know, simple routines, it's becoming uh, capable of doing some complex, uh, uh, complex processing. So that's, that's growing, and that's the rudimentary uh, use case. We just shipped um, Designer, which is DALI example of generative uh, visual design. So if you're doing you know, PowerPoint, or if you're creating um, you know, marketing materials, you now can use that, obviously, for, uh, for applications you no longer need to. It, the, the beautiful part of that is that it actually creates, cre provides creative ideas. I am personally, I would consider myself a semi-creative person, but I get blocked on ideas. So if I want to create, let's say, maybe, maybe not a logo, but let's say a page uh, that is, I don't know, pick something for, for the next conference, for my next talk on you know, humanity, humanitarian AI, let's say. I am not going to, I'll have some ideas about what the visuals uh, are going to be like. What I can use this for is to really broaden the aperture and create, generate ideas that I wouldn't normally think about, that I would need my, my friendly group of, of peers to brainstorm with me. So you can brainstorm with AI, which is really great. And then uh, I, I think the most valuable, I mean, in, in Microsoft, I mean, the company itself is really centered on productivity and empowering everybody to be more productive and, and being able to do more with less time. And while we're really excited about the general generative capabilities of AI, I think not, no less important, maybe even more important, 
is actually the distillation, the reasoning, the understanding capabilities of, of AI. So simple things that, uh, that we think about and that you can now use in Teams, for example, is you know, simultaneous translation, transcription, and now summarization, action items. So out of the sea of data that we all deal with every day, um, it's able to bring out the nuggets that we actually need to be thinking about. So instead of me reading 20 papers every day or even just a bunch of emails, now it can highlight to me what, are the, what is the summary, what, what has passed in the last 24 hours that I missed because I was at the conference. <laughs> Well, 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 one pro tip for all of you who are using the auto-suggest PowerPoint slide thing, uh, it's good for expressing emotion <laughs> when you want to, but if you do too much emotion through your whole presentation, no one can really hear you, so add a little spice, right? Just for the spice, for the spice. Um, but um, I remember when I first met you, Lila, I was so impressed with how you as an executive would go to the customer and go to oil rigs and go to understand, like, <laughs> what are they using this for? So. Is that sort of a part of how you see this uh, new space of large, large model AI is going to improve being close to a customer? That's a great question. I think, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, it really needs to work for each and single one of us. Hmm. So whether, and what's, what's really interesting is that the people who are out there on the front lines hmm. are actually asking for technology to help them in their, in their work. And we're also facing, especially in Western economies, a situation where uh, the reproductive rate is low and ultimately we're going to not have enough people to do the kind of work that we are doing today. So the manual work is going away just by, has to go away to, to a degree uh, because there aren't enough humans being, you know, out there. It's a demographic gap. So at that side, we really need to understand where and what we can automate and where can we apply AI to help people. And the most important parts are where people are in danger. And there are plenty of those areas, right? Whether it's a, it is an oil rig, and I hope oil rigs go away, you know, completely, <laughs> you know, and, and we don't need help to help there. But whether it is a, a, a medical environment where we, we see people exposed to, let's say, viruses, whether it, uh, uh, it, is a, uh, it is a mine, whether it is in the middle of the ocean, in space, right? Where are the different places where we need, uh, we need to remove the dangerous work? But it's, some of it is, is pretty basic. It's operating heavy equipment, for example. It's actually very dangerous work. You know, if you are, if you are uh, operating a tractor or, or, or an excavator, uh, it's very easy to get hurt. Uh, that's very trivially automatable at this point, right? So that's coming. Um, and then in terms of uh, sort of the kind of work that you and I are doing, I think we'll, it's, it's, will be quite disruptive, I think, for, uh, for us, you know, because I think we're going to re have to rethink how we do work and what work we're doing and what work AI is going to be able to do for us and potentially even do better than us. I'm glad you read that. So the, the danger thing, some workers are in danger. Like my uncle was in the Navy and he lost his hand uh, working in a helicopter. So danger is real and technology can sometimes mitigate that. Now we're going to go to the programming world, uh, the nerd, n more, more nerdiness here. Um, so the word prompt is like, you know, the, the word, right? Um, and if you just think like just two years ago, uh, LCNC, low code, no code, everyone mm -hmm. knew the acronym, but now it's kind of going away because of the large language model boom. So do you think in the future people will learn how to program? or to learn to prompt instead? What kind of benefits do you see customers getting from this prompt method? Yeah, we were actually joking backstage that uh, uh, prompt engineering will be a job description or a job title in the next couple of years if it's not already, because that's where it definitely is, is where we're, we're going and, and uh, the kind of skill that's going to be needed, I think Nat was talking about, uh, the fact that you actually need to be able to search properly and it's a skill, so the next skill is how do you communicate with AI. I think ultimately the way that you will be communicating with AI is the way that you and I are communicating. But the problem is, is that language is actually highly lossy. It's a lossy construct, so how can we tune it and optimize it? And of course, 
human brain is going to go there, which is, you know, th that's why prompt engineering is going to be really important. But in, in all seriousness, if I think back about what fundamentally is programming, coding, it's a mode of thinking. It's a way to reason and instruct, all right? It's, uh, uh, and I think what we need, to, where we're going to be shifting, because it's going to shift more and more towards nat natural language, is the really important part for humans is going to be to learn how to, how to think logically. Right, and not everybody does that today. And if we go even further back to sort of Socratic method and understanding and, and figuring out the world, you know, when I, when, uh, when I was at Wikipedia, oh, we, we put a lot of, of focus and effort at uh, thinking about a critical thinking. Right? Critical thinking is a skill that we learn, some of us learn in school or we learn throughout our lives. It's extremely important. And fundamentally, programming actually goes back to formulating some of that, hmm. is making sure that we are asking the right questions in order to get to an answer, because predetermined answer is not interesting. Um, so asking the right questions is that fundamental construct. There's a, there's a proverb, an old ancient proverb, it's much better to have a strong question than a weak answer. Mm. So I think we're gonna need to start asking and start learning to ask much stronger questions. Oh, that was a nice moment. I mean, I, I spent a lot of my career trying to teach people how to program um, at MIT. And I, I came to the realization that well, programming is hard to teach people who don't want to, who don't want to program. Um, but critical thinking is a kind of different level of coding that can happen with prompt engineering because you're dealing with much higher level constructs than just essentially formulas. That's, uh, that's big. It's, it's abstraction, right? So, yeah. so taking it to the level of uh, uh, figuring out, at the end of the day, what we're trying to find is the truth and the right questions to ask along the journey right. um, is, is, the important, is the important part. And you know, if you even think about education, and, and AI, I believe, is going to be a very useful for educating. Yeah. Um, but if you think about yeah. education, Let's the see. question here is how do we teach somebody mm -hmm. to learn on their own? Because the world is changing every second of the, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's changing faster, yeah. right? So how do we help you know, the next generation of, mm -hmm. of people to, to learn independently and to instead of you know, believing anything that they see out there in their social media or, uh, on, the, you know, or on the internet, or even if AI is telling them. You know, how do we teach them to learn and to figure out what is the truth, what is the right answer? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's symbolic that we're here in a jazz center because um, I remember someone at IBM told me that in the, uh, in the 60s and well, in the 70s, there was no computer science department. So then when they were recruiting right. for talent, they went to music departments because that music is something you go through an intermediary language. To, and so, but the problem with music, uh, the, the, the coding form, you can, the emotion comes from the artist. It sounds like you're describing that liberal arts graduates will have a bigger impact on computation. That's a provocative way to put it. Uh, I, I think we're going to see massive change in how we think about disciplines in general. I think we're going to go, going to go back to first principles, so understanding mathematics, understanding basic scientists, and understanding what makes arts, actually arts, the fundamentals of arts, like what's, yeah. what makes for, for good music. Emotion is, is very interesting. You know, when we uh, first create, I think a few years ago, thinking back to a few years ago, when we created synthetic speech, uh, and uh, um, the model was extremely good at mimicking uh, your cadence and your voice, and uh, just from a few sentences, it can start speaking like the two of us, then we can just conduct the interview through, <laughs> through the model. But the challenge was the emotion, the figuring out the crescendos and diminuendos of the speech, the emotional component of the speech. I think we're going to figure out how to do that because even today you can start just because you can say, uh, uh, we can get, give style to Dali, like give it in this style. I think we're going to, it's going to be able to pick up also on the emotional contact, uh, content as it, uh, as it 
comes as it, as it matures. The question is, is whether it's going to be the content that we want, hmm. right? Uh, it's creativity is really interesting, uh, a part of that. And it's the last statement. So when, uh, uh, during the Dartmouth, um, a workshop in was it 1956 when that's broadly uh, is considered the the genesis of AI. They wrote this I think seven is that uh, different points of what they wanted AI to considered important for AI right to um, to be um, to be I guess useful and the interesting part is that we're sort of slowly working through that list. You know, there's language in there, there's uh, a a autonomy in there, and the very last piece is randomness and creativity. And I think we're, we're getting there. We're very, very close. But I don't think it's going to be one or another. I think it's going to be a collaboration between what AI makes possible and what humans want to use it for. I just blown over the, the your critical thinking point just sort of has me frozen. Oh, you're, you're still <laughs> it's, there. It's, I'm still like, whoa, yeah, oh, whoa. Okay, so sorry. Um, uh, so now we're moving to AR, VR, XR, another piece in the repertoire of Lila. Uh, so all this like you know new breakthroughs in large model this and diffusion that whatever kind of thing. AR, VR, XR, metaverse has kind of fallen into the background a little bit, but it's still important. Yeah. So could you talk a bit about where Microsoft is in the journey of the metaverse plus AI and how you see them coming together for different use cases for customers? Yeah, it's actually really interesting because AR and AI were in the same product group. If, you're, if you remember, I, 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 was, I was writing that when, uh, when it's a few, a few years back when AI was a little bit younger. And I think the reason for that is because we were thinking about how AI and new interfaces work together. And, and of course, AI is so much more than you know, one type of interface is going to infuse into all kinds of interaction paradigms that we're going to have. So it's, it's split off in its own, uh, it's, it's its own really massive uh, investment now. Uh, but what is interesting is that uh, AR, VR is not really possible without significant AI. And if you use even the way that I use the HoloLens, for example, uh, is I never, I never use it with, with hands. I never try to do anything uh, visual, traditional on it. I just speak to it. And it's, it's extremely easy and powerful, but people don't think about that right away. And that's just one example. I mean, down the line, not only going to, are you going to, to talk to it, right? You're going to, it's, it picks up your eye movements. Mm -hmm. So it's even faster communication device because now you can look at something, say something, it will understand what, what you want, right? Um, uh, but it's a, it's a race condition a little bit. So AR needs to, not only is it need, does it need AI that's not just language, it's not just uh, a biometrics of your face and, and understanding, uh, understanding your body, it also needs to understand the world. So it's combining all kinds of AI, so autonomous AI, right? So the kind of stuff that we're doing for autonomous driving, combining the perception uh, stack that we need for to understand your body and your face, and you know language models and generative models. So all of that needs to fuse together in order to create a really amazing experience. And then on top of that, you need hardware. And hardware is also sort of in, is in, a, in, a, in its own race, right? The silicon is now getting better and better, especially edge silicon for AI. Cloud is getting better and better because you have to stream a lot of this content. You know, our xCloud is, is part of you know, how we think about that. And then, uh, on, of course, you know, the networking has to be there. And then the devices, I mean, the device needs to look like the, you know, what you're wearing on your face and no more, no less, right? It needs to be acceptable uh, through, that, the, through that. So the use cases that we have uh, worked on and we're continuing to work on that are extremely useful and extremely helpful is one is the Department of Defense uh, um, uh, use case and, and, the, and the work that we're doing there. And then, of course, the industrial use case. So we just talked about the people who are out there on the front line. This is really useful for them because they can see through somebody else's eyes, right? I can guide somebody who is out there, you know, in a different, uh, in a different country, right? And speak to them in their language even though I don't know it. So all of these use cases are really, really valuable. But as we sort of work towards the uh, 
the nirvana use case, you know, if you think about the cell phone, you know, we started with these big bricks and, the, and, and things that we had to carry in our suitcases, you know, back in the day to something that is seamless and frictionless and uh, beautiful, right? We're on the journey there, and the AI is critical to making it possible. Whoa. Uh, you know, I, I remembered when uh, in VR in the 80s, uh, we had, remember what, know what a polemus is? A 3D sensor? No? Long time ago, old people. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and the data glove, it used fiber optics to be able to sense whatever. And so I, I bought every Oculus that came out. So I'm like, I just, I just love how it can track your hands. But I, uh, in that era, a speech and a voice was also competing, but kept losing all the time. But you're describing down. it in the world you live in. It's not a. Oh, it's better it's a, than it's superhuman ability now wow. that can pick up whatever language you are speaking. You yeah. know, is fine. And I think we also think I'm very constrained about how we think about AR. We think always in terms of this device that's on our face, but it's not. It's actually really all around us. I mean, if we th think about metaverses, you know, the gaming all, is already there. Right, so uh, it's it's a little bit funny for for me to think about that when we have you know bunch of uh, people in the, in the game in the in this environments playing. It doesn't have to be three D. It can be two D. It can be zero D. Right. So we we just created a a whole group which is for industrial called industrial metaverse, <laughs> um, where it's all about what what are the sensors around you. You know, what are the things that are creating and understanding the space, understanding you in it, and actually feeding you the right information? Um, and then, of course, like even if you think about a car, right? So within the car, so as cars become autonomous, as they become effectively pods, what is the experience within the car? That's also sort of like an AR experience on wheels, sort of. And what does that work? How does that work? So I think we, we need to remove the constraints of a specific device from, from the topic. Okay, I'm going to do a quick review here for all of you because I'm sort of like processing it myself. Uh, we talked a bit about art. Uh, we touched upon this notion of visual language as covering centuries of knowledge. And perhaps that's really fueled a lot of what uh, any uh, diffusion model or large language model, this, that, whatever, is producing images. So makes sense, all possible, um, because language existed and the computer could interpret that. We talked about applied situations that are either close to the customer or close to features that are emerging. Um, and uh, the computer is prolific at generating options. But again, we humans get to curate that. We talked about prompting. We talked about low code, no code, going to prompt engineering. And there was a brief moment of critical thinking emerge its head. And I'm sure some of you froze with me that uh, Liberal arts majors, there's, there's so many of them, by the way, because I'm very, um, and so they will be able to really contribute to computation in a really special way, it sounds like, so that's very exciting. We talked about AR, VR, XR in a way that I'm now going to have to rethink my love for hand tracking, so I'll have to have <laughs> finger tracking. I'm like, a little broken there. Um, it's but, and, um, it's not or. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Combo, combo, combo platter. Um, well, thank you, Lila. Thank you, audience, for listening in. This has been a wonderful conversation, and we're on time. Thank you, John. Thank you.